And now for our unison reading from Genesis 12. Still on? Yep. Okay. Let us begin. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Benjamin and James. Benjamin and James, James, Benjamin and James, and Owen and Jack and Sam and Issa and Violet and Scarlett. And my name is? Excellent, excellent. We are good. All right, so we just heard a story about a man named Abraham. And what's remarkable about Abraham's story is that we read that God tells him, go, pick up everything your family, all that you own, and I'm going to, and go to where I tell you to go. And what did he do? He went. And what's amazing about that is almost everybody in scripture, when God says to do something, they say, are you sure? Are you sure? Me? Are you sure? I don't know. And they, everybody always has excuses. And what's amazing about Abraham is he just does it and has trust and faith in God. I was thinking about a time I went to a, used to go to the, a summer camp in Connecticut, a 4-H camp, and we did this, it was a trust walk. Ever heard of like trust falls? Yeah. You know, like when you fall backwards and you everybody catch oh, you. Yeah. Have you ever done that? All right. This was a trust walk where we, uh, we were blindfolded and you had somebody walk you through the woods, right? And so I, I still remember this, right? And I, I was with my friend Jimmy, and at one point I peeked. And he was so hurt that I didn't trust him, right? And, uh, and I think about, I think about God, the times when we trust God and when we don't trust God. And just so you know, Abraham started really well, but there are times in his story, too, where he doesn't trust God and he has to learn a tough lesson. And that's just part of life. Yes. Was this about Abraham Lincoln? You were thinking about Abraham Lincoln? Abraham? Different Abraham. Yes. Yes, Owen. Why is so giant? Why is what? Why is so giant? Why am I so giant? not sure how to answer that <laughs> my grandpa was really tall and I got his genes so I, I um, try not to think of myself as a giant <laughs> do you know do you know there's actually I did a wedding once where I was the short one right this is totally off about that I did a wedding once and I was the short one the the bride was like six foot and the groom was like six four and I said you know we should start a tall club right and and then I asked them where they met and they said tall club there is such a thing for people who are really tall and guess what I'm too short <laughs> you have to be five women you have to be five ten or above I'm only five nine for the time being anyway neither here nor there where were we about faith and trust in our best moments, we are trusting God, and um, God understands it when we're like, are you sure? But when you get convicted that God, you know, that God wants you to do something, and, and you do it, yay, the heavens rejoice. And, and when we don't, there's usually a tough lesson that, that comes with it, but guess what? There's always another chance, again and again and again, to do the right thing. Got it? Shall we fold our hands? Bow our heads, close our eyes. 
gracious God, uh, for when those moments when we do the right thing right off the bat, we are so proud of ourselves, and we hope we make you proud. For all the tough lessons that we need to learn, thank you for loving us and forgiving us and giving us second chances again and again and again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The Wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Jesus lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So years ago, I went to a clergy retreat. This is, I was a, I want to say how many years ago. I've been doing this almost 30 years. So let's say, you know, 25 years ago. I went to a clergy retreat. Newton Presbytery in the fall used to have a retreat by the Jersey Shore. And we would all go. It was a time of fellowship, spiritual renewal, but also teaching and it was run by the clergy and for as long as i have been in ministry there has been concern about the future of the church there has been decline since uh the 1960s before i was born and so at this retreat people were sharing their ideas and we need to this was also at the height of the worship wars if you, if you know what I'm talking about, you know, we all need to have music. We, we need to have bands. You need a drummer. You need a guitar player, you know, and that's, and people will come for that, right? It's all bogus, you know. It's, it, you can, it, I don't need to go there, but uh, I shouldn't go there, but it's all bogus. But they all have all these ideas about how to reinvigorate the church and what, you know, what we're doing to, you know, to try to, to, try to grow. And, at one of the gatherings, one of the nights, uh, we're in the you know big circle oval, and one of the older pastors who was nearing retirement said, "I can't do this anymore." And not everybody heard him, but those around him did. And so, you know, what are you, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And he said, "I can't come to these anymore." And we're like, "Why?" And he said, "All this, you know, what we need to do." differently he goes I just feel so judged like I have been a failure like my entire career has been for naught
Nicodemus goes to visit Jesus and, there, and says to him, we know there's something to you because who could be doing these things without God? And they have this conversation about needing to be born again and Nicodemus is, is, is confused, who wouldn't be? And Jesus says to him, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Let's just sit with that for a second. How Nicodemus must have felt. Ever learned something that changes everything for you? I am part of, of a teaching team that helps, that teaches transitional ministry. A lot of the pastors who come have no intention of becoming transitional pastors, but they're learning it because every church is in transition and they want to learn the skills. And one uh, pastor said to me, gosh, I wish I had learned this stuff 30 years ago, not when I'm walking out the door, ready to retire. Ever learn something that, you know, you are schooled by somebody and something that you have always believed or something that you have always done you suddenly realize is harmful to somebody else and you have to live with that and sit with that. For those of us who have children who have grown up when they're able to grow up and tell you to your face all the things that you've done wrong. And they're right. For all the folks who have, I've seen people on the journey who for years use this, use scripture as a hammer to beat other folks over the head with only to realize that, gosh, it would have been so much more effective if they'd used it as a love letter. Does it mean that Nicodemus got it all wrong? No. Was he a sham? No. He was living out his faith as he understood it. But as God is like to do, Jesus rips the rug out from underneath him, and he falls on his butt, and finds himself in the middle of the wrestling mat with God again. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things when I learned that the name of Jacob, who's Jacob, who wrestles with God all night, will not let go unless he's given a blessing. His name becomes Israel, which means one who wrestles with God, and that's what it means to be a person of faith, to wrestle with God. And again, Jacob said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. We're going to come back to that blessing. But let's think again, Nicodemus, or those times in our life where suddenly, oh my gosh, where to from here? Wendell Berry, the poet, farmer, activist, wrote, when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. That is a faith journey. Figuring it out in conversation with God as we go along. Like Abraham. God says, go. Go where? To a place I will show you. Uh, okay. Okay. And Abraham went. And what am I going to do? Where, where I go? The answer, be a blessing. Abraham is told, I will bless the world through you. That's your job. The women's book group that meets on Wednesday uh, afternoons just finished a book, An Altar in the World, and the last chapter was on blessing, and we had an, a wonderful conversation about the word blessing. We wrestled with the word. It's a slippery word. It has a je ne sais quoi quality to it, or as someone said, it's, it's more than the sum of its parts. 
blessing. God has, somehow has to be part of it, in it. There's a God element that makes it a blessing. Heard the story, uh, a pastor told the story of going to a, a store. It was Christmas time, and she got in a conversation with the cashier who shared that Christmas, she's not having a hard time getting into the Christmas spirit because her mom died this year. And she said, it's not that I was that close to my mom. I don't even know whether I would have spent Christmas with her, but now I know I will never spend Christmas with her. And it's just a hard time. And somehow God got into the conversation and the pastor outed herself as a pastor. And then the woman said, you know, I never talk about God. I can't tell you the last time I even talked to God. But it's so special to know that I can still have holy moments. And the pastor said, yeah, this was a holy moment. God shows up in the ordinary exchanges of our days and blesses them. Having just heard that story, I was in the grocery store the other day, and I had two items. And I, might, I try to go to the cashier and not the self-checkout, but I, again, not a purist. Um, I had two items, which is like, you know, the, it'd be so much quicker if I go to the, to the self-checkout. Again, I want people to have jobs. So that's why I want there to be more cashiers in the stores. Anyway, so... I decide, having just heard this conversation, I'm going to go to the cashier. And the guy in front of me, total extrovert, is, is and he obviously has had talked with this woman very often. He's just like, oh, my gosh, my back hurts this morning. He goes, I just got a job, and I, my gar- garage door opener wasn't working, so I thought, oh, sure, I'll lift it and mount my back. And, and she's just going, have, you know, have you gone to the doctor, and what are you taking? And, and, and then he goes, oh, and have you seen those, those kids lately? How are your kids? And she pulls out her phone. Here, I have a picture. Right? And, she, and he saw them, and I got to see the twins that she goes to visit. And they're her niece's children who she goes to. She goes to Connecticut on Sunday nights and comes back on Wednesday, and she helps watch these kids. And then she's working because what else is she going to do? And then the man leaves, and she goes, oh, man, so funny, you know. Was, and then we started talking about our backs and keeping our core strong. And I'm like, I plank. Do you plank? And she's like, Oh no, you know. And and we had this. And I walked away. And we they finished the conversation with, It's been delightful talking with you. I hope you have the great rest of your day. And I walked away thinking, Gosh, I hope that was a blessing to her day because it sure was to mine. Going, looking for ways to bless one another. That's what we're called to do. Uh, We can't do it on our own. God has to show up, but we have to show up too. Where? God will show us. So again, I work with pastors, and there's a lot of fear of churches closing, and there's lots of... um, hear lots of, of concern for s- small churches. Uh, and one person, and this wasn't a pastor, this is actually in a completely different conversation, who is frustrated for these little churches who are just waiting for Jesus to show up and make everything better. And here's my analysis. I think we've got a spiritual problem <laughs> And it's not, it's not just laity, and it's, it's clergy as well. When we th- I, I don't think you can kill a church. As long as we are being church, there will be a church. You know, we tend to associate churches with, with the institution of church or church as building. And I, I try to always talk about the church as building because this building is not the church. You are the church. We are the church. As long as we are in the world seeking to be a blessing, we are being church, and there will always be a church. 
We are called to embody our faith wherever we go and to get to that point in our faith journey where it is so integrated into who we are, our faith, that every action, every interaction is a blessing. A follower of Jesus Christ wherever we are, a blessing by the grace of God wherever we are. I recently spoke at the retirement of a, of a friend who's, re- who's retired from ministry, David. I adore David. And he is looking back on his legacy as, as a pastor. The first church that he ever served was in Newton Presbytery, and it recently closed its doors. He then went with his wife to do a a new church plant out west. It did not flourish. And then he went to Michigan to a church where when he left it, it was 300 members strong, was flourishing, was doing really well. Uh, But something happened with the next pastor, who I also know, who's a friend, and that church closed. And now he's leaving a church that's, you know, it's doing okay. It's struggling like so many churches. And he's looking back and wondering about his legacy. The reason I adore David is because he so embodies his faith. When you are with him, he gives you, he, he's one of those, he's a pastor's pastor. We always, we always, you know, that's a compliment when a pastor talks about another pastor. That's a pastor's pastor. He looks at you. He listens. He leans in. He, you know that he's, he cares about you. He's compassionate. He's loving. He will someday hear, well done, good and faithful servant. He has blessed so many people over the years. He has so much to be proud of. We overcomplicate things. It's not rocket science. It's seeking to be a blessing. Your new mission statement, we could summarize it to seek to be a blessing in the community. Your, new, your mission statement is Grace Presbyterian Church, connecting with people through Christ to serve the spiritual, physical, and emotional needs of the community and the world around us. To be a blessing. How are you going to do it? You're going to pray. You're going to listen. And God is going to lead. Let us recommit ourselves once again. Keeping it, keeping it simple. Love God, love neighbor, love self. And you will live a blessed life. And you will bless people around you. And the people around you will know themselves blessed for having known you. And we'll screw up because, 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 because we're folks. But know that each and every day we are reborn to the task, to the call. To be a blessing. So go, not yet, later, but when you go, know that the God made known in Jesus Christ goes with you, with blessing in his wake. In Jesus' name, amen.